today is there's a little bit of repeat of what we've gone over. We've kind of touched on some of this, so we should be able to get through this one in a fairly timely manner. I have three lessons left, and beginning then next week, the last three lessons, we're going to kind of get into the practical aspect of what we've been learning. How do we take these tools and then kind of put them into practice? And we're going to talk about study tools, some uh, like Bible dictionaries and study Bibles and commentaries and various things like that. Just some tools that you can get that will help you um, to uh, be able to study the Bible better. Um, so we'll look at, start looking at that some of that next week. But today, the rule that we're going to look at here is the rule of the difference between interpretation and application. The difference between interpretation and application. Okay, everybody get that? The difference between interpretation and application. So let's, real quick, just to have a, I guess, kind of a jumping off verse, let's go to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2. In verse 15. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so this is kind of where we get into the rightly dividing aspect, when we're understanding the difference between interpretation and application. And what often happens is people will read a verse of the Bible or a passage and a phrase will stick out and they will automatically jump to application. Well, this is how I feel about the verse. This is what it means to me. Or they'll take it for some completely different meaning than what God intended the meaning to be. And so then we really run into some problems. So let's look at what is the difference between interpretation and application. So interpretation is this. It refers to the basic meaning of a Bible passage. It refers to the basic meaning of a Bible passage gleaned according to the sound rules of interpretation. So in essence, it's what does this passage mean? Not what does it mean to me. But what did it mean originally when it was first written? Okay, application. Now, I, I did a no-no here. I, I remember when I was in grade school, I had a teacher who was a stickler. and We would have to, when we would go through our spelling words, we had to define all of those words. And you were not allowed to define a word by the word you're using, trying to look for. Well, I did that here, and so I'm sorry. But application refers to applying a passage to daily living. Or I guess you could say it's putting it into practice, knowing how to put it into practice in your daily living. But that's interpretation application. So when you come to the scriptures, there's kind of three questions that you want to ask. And, and we sing it in Sunday school. As I read God's word each day, I will ask myself three questions. What does it say? What does it mean, and what is God saying to me? And so that's observation, interpretation, application. What does the verse say? And so you're getting into then, you have to understand the words. You know, if you don't understand the words, you can't know what the verse says. Okay? So you're going to look at the words. What do the words mean? Especially key words. That's observation. Then interpretation, okay, taking all this information, putting it together, now what exactly does this passage say, and then now how do I put it into practice in my life, okay? So now, 
Uh, I'm sure you've heard the phrase at one time or another, there's one interpretation and many applications of the passages of Scripture. Now that's true, but unfortunately the only times I've heard people say that is when they're going to preach something that is totally opposite of what is in the passage of Scripture. And it's just not a good way to do it. Um, and it is true, there is one interpretation and there are many applications but all the applications have to be in line with that interpretation. Okay, does that make sense? And this is what it means. Now, that may branch out into various areas and apply in various areas of my life, but all those applications have to be in line with what it actually says. You know, I, I can't just go off the deep end or come up with some random idea based upon, you know, whatever. It has to be in line with the interpretation. Um, one of the errors commonly committed is to focus on the application, as I mentioned a moment ago, of a passage without having first understood or emphasized the basic interpretation or the meaning. And so this is what people will do. And this is one of the big errors of, uh, while I'm all for home Bible studies, but where it often goes really bad is when it becomes an issue of, well, what does this passage mean to you, or what does this passage mean to me? And frankly, I don't care what it means to you. What did it mean when Paul wrote it? What did it mean when John wrote it? What did it mean when Moses wrote it? Because that's what it means. That's all it has ever meant. The question that needs to be asked, what does it mean? And then, now... Based upon what that means, is there a way that I can apply this to my life? So if I'm reading in Genesis, and I'm reading about Noah and the flood, and I read about God's command for Noah to come into the ark, or to go get gopher wood, build an ark of such a size, does that have a direct application to me? No. No because God's not telling me to build an ark. God's not telling me to come into the ark. But are there principles that we can glean from Noah and the ark? Absolutely. I mean, you can preach the gospel there. I mean, the Peter does. He uses the, anal the, uh, the narrative of Noah and the ark and the saving of the household to refer to the gospel and salvation. And so we can do that. We can talk about Noah's obedience. We can talk about his faith, as Paul does in the Hebrews chapter 11. So there are all sorts of applications we can cut, that we can draw from it, but we have to have the basic meaning of the passage as it was penned by Moses when he wrote it, because that's what it means. It doesn't matter what it means to me. What if you had not existed? Does it therefore have no meaning? And so that, that's the way people look at the Bible. But... We have to look at the Bible. What do the words say? What do the words mean? Because that's what it means. And that's all it has ever meant. That's all it will ever mean. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay? All right. Good. So when we're handling a passage of Scripture, we have to first determine the interpretation, and then only after we have the basic interpretation, then we can begin to apply it. Okay, you know, one of the Sunday school songs that I, I don't think we've sung it here, and, and I'm glad for that, but one I kind of grew up with, and it was sung almost every Sunday as the choir would come into the choir loft. Every promise in the book is mine, every chapter, every verse, every line. Uh, let me see. Uh, all our blessings of his love divine, every promise in the book is mine. Now, that sounds really good, and it sounds really spiritual, but it's not true. All of the Bible was not written to us. It was written for us. Paul tells us it was written for us, for our admonition, for our learning. So we can learn how God deals with people and how, from people's experiences, but it was not written to us. Okay, It was written to various audiences. When Paul wrote to Timothy, Paul was writing a letter to Timothy. But we can learn from what he wrote to Timothy. Right? So it's for us, but it's not written to us. So we have to keep those things in mind because there may be some things that don't directly apply to us because of the time period. You know, it's like the book of Acts. 
The book of Acts was not written to us. It was written to Theophilus at a time when people were still speaking in tongues and when miracles were being done. But that's not taking place today. So we have to be careful that we understand we're, that it's written for us, but it's not written to us. Let's look at some examples of this. Okay, Let's go to Deuteronomy. And we've covered, I think, all of these verses. So we're just going to... This is more of a refresher, and then we'll go into the next couple rules here. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 30. So Deuteronomy chapter 30. Verse number 3. That then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee, and will return and gather thee from all nations, whither the Lord thy God hath scattered thee. If any of thine be driven out unto the outmost parts of heaven, from thence will the Lord thy God gather thee, and from thence will he fetch thee. And the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed, and thou shalt possess it, and he will do thee good and multiply thee according to thy fathers. Uh, and the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart, and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and that thou mayest live. And the Lord thy God will put these curses upon thine enemies, and on them that hate thee, which persecuted thee. Okay. Now there's several things that a person could just reading this casually without really considering the context could draw out of this really bad applications. So in verse three, there he says, "The Lord thy God will turn thy captivity." So a person who is struggling with something could read that and be like, oh, the Lord's speaking to me. Well, this is what I get from this. The Lord is wanting to turn my captivity away and, and free me from this. And so this is a promise, and I'm going to claim this promise. Or when he says, I will bring thy seed back. Well, I have a child that's going astray, and Lord, I just you said you would turn my seed back. God didn't say any of that. The context here is the covenant that it's called the land covenant. And it's a covenant that says that if, actually just prior to this, if Israel doesn't keep God's law and his covenant, he's going to drive them out of the land. But when we come to chapter 30, God is making a covenant with Israel that after they have gone through this period of time out of the land, that God is going to come back and he's going to bring them back to the land and he's going to save them. That's the context. In fact, if we go back to chapter 29, verse 1. Look at chapter 29, verse 1. These are the words of the covenant which the Lord commanded Moses to make with the children of who? Israel. So who was this written to? It's written to Israel. Are there some things that we can learn from this? Absolutely. Is God going to bring the children of Israel back to the land? Absolutely. Jesus says it in Matthew chapter 24. It's in Isaiah. It's in Ezekiel. It's in Daniel. It's in the book of Revelation. They're going to be back in the land. What can we glean from that? God keeps his promises. What else can we get from it? Why are the nation of Israel scattered? Because they didn't believe God and obey him. Does God require for us to believe and obey him? Absolutely. And is there chastening that comes along with not believing and not obeying? Absolutely. So those are our applications. Does that make sense? We can't just take a phrase because we like it, underline our Bible and say, this is a promise to me. No, this is a promise to Israel. So we have to be careful with that. Let's go to Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15. Okay, verse number one. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Well, I was just reading this the other day, and God just tells me, Fear not. God didn't tell you anything. God told Abram to fear not. Now, the context here is the Abrahamic covenant, that he's going to have a seed, and he's going to give the land 
to Abram's seed. Paul tells us that the seed is Jesus Christ and all those that are in Christ. Okay, so it's not until I get the context that I can understand. Okay, so Abram and his seed is the context, and therefore the promise is not just to fear not, it's for Abram and his seed. And so he says, I'll be a shield and a great reward. So you see, I mean, maybe that's hair splitting, but just so we understand, we have to get the context before we move to application. Let's look at another one. Let's look at 2 Chronicles 7. And this one we looked at a little bit more in depth. I'm not going to look at this one in depth, but just to kind of highlight it again. 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14. Probably almost every Baptist church, almost, around Memorial Day or July 4th, they're going to somewhere mention this verse in the message. And so 2 Chronicles 7, 14, If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and heal their land. And if we want God to heal our land and bring revival to our land, then God's people have to turn away from their sin and seek Him. Is that what it says? No, the context, if you read back, this is God's answer to Solomon. And Solomon is saying that if... Uh, God tells Solomon, if you keep the covenant, then you'll stay in the land. But if you don't keep the covenant, then I'm going to send famine and pestilence to the land. And so here we have God's promise that if his people, talking about Israel, he says, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked way, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. The healing of the land there is not talking about revival in the land. The healing of the land is talking about sending rain. And so the crops will grow, and so the physical land will be healed and be fruitful. That's what it's talking about. Now, can we draw application from that? Sure. If, God, if we as God's people humble ourselves and pray and seek His face and turn from His wicked way, will there be spiritual benefits to that? Absolutely. But it has nothing to do with the land. Just because we get right with God doesn't mean all of a sudden the White House is going to turn Christian. In fact, at the point in which we're at now, if God's people actually did this, we would probably face persecution like we've never faced in the last 150 years. So we have to get the interpretation before we move to application. Let's look at one more. Let's go to John chapter 14. And I did want to say, and it'll be reiterated in the morning service. Beginning next week, we're going to be starting on time, Sunday school, at 9.45. That, that's the, it's my fault. We haven't been doing that since I got here because when I got here, I thought, you know, 9.45, who does that? I understand why. Alex is just a really long-winded teacher, and so he needs that extra time. No. <laughs> I had that problem, too. <laughs> um. But that way we can get the full time in and also for the way the curriculum is done up for the kids, there's other activities and such that are in there that help them with the lesson and they need the extra time to actually be able to do all that stuff. Uh, so John chapter 14, notice verse 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Now, here's what some people do. I don't need church. I don't need uh, any books about the Bible or anything like that. All I need, and I, he I actually heard a preacher yesterday, he says, my commentary is the Holy Spirit. I, I don't need anybody else to teach me, just my Bible and just the Holy Spirit. That's all that I need because he says he'll teach me all things. That wasn't said to you. That was said to the apostles in the upper room with the Lord, and they are the ones who are giving us the Scripture. And notice, he says, 
He shall bring, to, right at the end there, he shall, and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Has Jesus spoken to any of us? No. So how can he bring anything to our remembrance that the Lord has spoken? Now, is there some application we can draw from this? Absolutely. Do we have the Holy Ghost? Yes. Does he illuminate us as we're studying the scriptures? Absolutely. He helps us understand. He does guide us. When there's scripture that we have memorized and you're kind of in that discussion with somebody and it's like, okay, I need a verse right now. And then all of a sudden, there it is in your mind. Sure, he helps us. But this is directly related to the apostles in reference to the scripture that Jesus was going to give. That's how we got the gospels. How do we know that the gospels are 100% accurate? And they weren't written, they weren't like walking around with Jesus writing down word for word everything that he said. So how do we know that they're accurate? Because the Holy Spirit brought all things to their remembrance so they could write it down. That's how that happened. That's what that verse is talking about. Okay, so, but we can get an application from it, but we have to have the right interpretation first. Otherwise, we start going wonky in our application. So when it comes to application, the Bible student and teacher must be careful that it is legitimate. It must conform to the truth of God's word. So let's move on to the next rule here. So the next rule, and I don't think I have any more blanks for you to fill out, but just kind of follow along here. The rule that doctrine cannot be built on the Bible's silence. Okay, Doctrine cannot be built on the Bible's silence. Let's go to Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14. Verse 1, him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. So it, essentially what he's referring to here is you have some people that are coming over primarily from the Jewish faith, or some people who were um, deeply involved in paganism. And so as they would sacrifice all their... they. They didn't just have a slaughterhouse. Paul refers to it in Corinthians as the shambles. Um, and, and basically, their butcher shops were idol temples. So if you wanted meat, and you go to the store, kind of the marketplace, to get meat, that meat has been offered in sacrifice to an idol. Okay, and so, and, and Paul deals with this a little bit more in Corinthians, but here what's going on is a person who is stronger in the faith realizes that idol is nothing. I can, I can eat that meat and it's no big deal. But somebody who is newer in the faith or has a weaker faith, their faith is not yet developed, in their mind, if I am eating this, then I'm actually uh, condoning the sacrifice to idols. And I'm supporting idol sacrifice. I, and, and this is one of those things that people talk about all the time. So it's kind of like, well, if I buy Pepsi, then I'm supporting homosexuality, and so I won't buy Pepsi because they support homosexual causes. Well, no, I'm buying Pepsi because I like Pepsi. Well, some people have a weaker conscience, and therefore they say to support them to buy that product. I remember when I was in Bible college, I remember one morning... So we had a, there was a couple girls there, sisters, and their family was really strict. I mean, really strict. Diet and everything. Well, one morning, I, Subway cookies. I mean, Subway has like got the corner on the market on their chocolate chip cookies. I, my wife loves the cheesecake, strawberry cheesecake or whatever that is. And I like the chocolate chip cookies. So one morning when I was in Bible college, I thought, you know, I'm going to be there when the door opens so I get the cookies fresh out of the oven. And I was there, and I did that. So I got back to the college, and I'm enjoying my cookies. Well, one of the girls comes in, oh, 
Don't you know that they support homosexuals? I'm not supporting homosexuals. I'm supporting my belly. That, that's what I'm doing. Well, later on, they finally changed their mind. But this is the type of thing that Paul's talking about right here. And so him that is weak in the faith eateth herbs. So they won't eat by meat because they think that they're supporting the idol sacrifices. So they'll only eat vegetables. Okay, now Paul tells Timothy that vegetarianism is a doctrine of devils. Okay, because doctrine of devils is commanding to abstain from meat. Okay, so I'm all meat. Every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused, Paul says. So we, we can eat everything. And if you want to be a vegetarian, go ahead. Just don't try to push it on me because it'll never work, okay? It will never work. Now, verse 3 says, Let not him that eateth, eateth the meat, despise him that eateth not. And let not him which eateth not despise him that eateth. Why? For God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. One man, notice this, esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord. He that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks and he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not and giveth God thanks. Now notice what he says there in verse 5. One man esteemeth one day above another, and another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Okay? Let me ask you this. Is it right or wrong to work on Sunday? Does the Bible say anything about it? Does the Bible say, thou shalt not work on Sunday? No. Now, we meet as a church on Sunday, and so you're supposed to be, when the church has decided to meet, we're supposed to gather together. That's what we're supposed to do, regardless of the day of the week. That's what we're supposed to do. But outside of that, the Bible doesn't say. See, what happens is a lot of people, and this is the way it was in America, probably most of you remember a time when on Sunday... If you wanted gas for the weekend, you had to get it on Saturday because Sunday the gas station is going to be closed, the market is going to be closed unless you had like a Muslim or something in town that owned a gas station, which probably didn't happen too many places around here. <laughs> but why? Because Sunday was the Sabbath. That was the mindset. There was actually a time in America that if you did anything on Sunday besides go to church, you would get arrested because Sunday is the Sabbath. Sunday is not the Sabbath. Sunday is Sunday. Sabbath is the last day of the week. It's the seventh day. Okay? But there are some people, they have the mindset, we don't do anything on Sundays except for, you know, we're, we're going to go to church on Sunday morning. We're not going to go to the store. We're not going to go out to eat. We're not going to do anything else. We're going to sit at home, and we're going to read our Bibles or just do kind of family things together. And then if you work on, this, on Sunday, then they kind of frown on that. The Bible doesn't say anything about that. The Bible doesn't say anything about what we're supposed to do on Sunday. Anywhere. And I know that's hard for us to kind of get our mind around because if you, probably some of you are like me, you were in a church where you weren't supposed to do anything else besides church stuff on Sunday. And it's almost as though we treat anything not church and not Bible as though it's unspiritual. Your family is very spiritual. If you're spending time with your family, that is a spiritual activity. If you're conducting business, that is a spiritual activity. Why? Because we are spiritual beings. Everything we do is spiritual. Okay? And here what Paul is saying, one man esteems one day above another. That's fine. If that's what you want to do on a Sunday, if that's what you think honors and glorifies God, that is totally okay. You do that. Nothing wrong with that at all. And if I don't, nothing wrong with that at all either. 
What does he say? Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. See, we don't build doctrine on the Bible's silence. So it's really interesting. I'm not sure if you're familiar with R.C. Sproul. Probably a couple of you are, uh, or at least the name. He is kind of like the modern-day John Calvin. Uh, He's with the Lord now, and so he knows better. But he's kind of the modern-day John Calvin. I listened to him debate John MacArthur one time, and John MacArthur would probably be a little bit closer to what we believe on things on the subject of baptism. R.C. Sproul believed in infant baptism. This was his chief argument. This is his chief argument. Now, I I would think you would at least have some sort of a Bible verse or something like that to kind of at least have a springboard, but this is the chief argument for infant baptism. Well, the Bible doesn't say we can't. That's the chief argument. That is the argument. The Bible doesn't say we can't, and the Bible doesn't say that they didn't. You can't build doctrine that way. I, that, that's a really bad argument, isn't it? I, that's just dumb. But that's the, that was the chief argument. You know, and I would think a guy who is one of the biggest leaders among Reformed people, author of many books, has a Bible college, has his own study Bible, that he would have a little bit better argument than, well, the Bible doesn't say we can't baptize babies. You, you can't build doctrine on the Bible's silence. Now, if there's, when there, where the Bible clearly states something, or where there's very clear principles in the Scripture, then we have God's mind on it. But if God hasn't specifically said something, then we have to be careful that we don't establish that as a doctrine. So how about this? We talked about this a couple Wednesdays ago. Let's just get real crazy for a moment. Right or wrong to have drums in church? I mean, real crazy. Okay, I mean, this is... This is like, I'm so far out on a limb, the only thing I have left to do is just cut the limb off where I'm standing, okay? So right or wrong to have drums in the church? The Bible doesn't say. Now, I'm not advocating for contemporary Christian music by any stretch of the imagination. I know of many churches that they have drums in the church, and they are played very pleasantly. That's not... The Bible doesn't say that it's wrong. The Bible doesn't necessarily say that it's right. In fact, if you go back to the Psalms, most of the Psalms had percussion music as an accompaniment. Now, we may not prefer that. That's fine. Or you may prefer that. That's fine. The Bible does not say Now, there are principles that govern that. Obviously, we don't want to be like the world. There needs to be a very clear distinction between the way our music is and the way the world's music is. But did you know that less than 200 years ago, you could not have an organ in a Baptist church? Because the idea was, well, the Catholics developed the organ. And therefore, it's sinful to have an organ. And pianos weren't a thing either, because those were bar music. And that's radical, isn't it? I mean, who would have thought that a Baptist preacher would say something like that in a church? But I, you see, and that's because it's been so driven into our mind. And, and what happens is it, it's easier to just throw out the baby with the bathwater. Because the moment you say, we can have something like this, then it becomes an issue of having to uh, regulate it, which most people don't want to have to do. Well, it can, be, it can go to this extent, but not this extent. And then you have to kind of monitor it all the time. And so it's just easier to say it's all wrong. But that's not right to say that. I mean, that, that's really weird. But, I mean, we can have our preferences... But we have to be very careful that we're not establishing as doctrine something that the Bible does not say. We have to be very careful about that. 
Another one. Let's, uh, let's go to Deuteronomy here real quick. Deuteronomy chapter 29. <laughs> That's just radical. <laughs> And it's kind of like the idea, well, do we have a song leader or do we have a worship team? All the psalms were written for a worship team. It's who the sons of Korah were. They were the worship team. They had a group of people that got up and they led the song together as opposed to just having one person. I know some churches that do that, they do a good job, but the people aren't up there jiving and dancing around and dressed in ungodly ways. See, we, we, we get so used to a way that we have always seen it done, and then to change that, we just think, oh, that's wrong. And that's where we have to be careful that we don't establish doctrine where the Bible's silent. So let's, let's move on here. So we need the next rule here is the rule that God has revealed what he wants to reveal for this age. Okay? God has revealed what he wants to reveal for this age. How many of you would really like to know all of the mind of God? Oh, that would be great. I would love to know a lot more than what's revealed in the Bible. But what God has revealed in the Bible is all that he wants us to know about these things. Okay, let's look at a verse here and then... Uh, so Deuteronomy 29, verse 29. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. Now, obviously, he is talking about the law of Moses in particular there. And more has been revealed since then. But there's a clear principle there that God has revealed certain things that he's revealed for us, and there are some things that he has not revealed. And when we don't understand this, then we start getting into false doctrine as well. So the ideas of Calvinism and Arminianism, those two theological systems, are based on trying to figure out things that God has not said. So let me ask you this. Does God know your future? Does he know the day you're going to die? Yes. Does he know every event that's going to take place in your life from the time you were born to the time you die? Does he know everything that people are going to do against you or for you? Okay. Now let me ask you this. Is God powerful enough that he could stop or change any of those events? Absolutely. Now, does that therefore mean that because God knows it and God has the ability to stop or change it, and hasn't, that therefore he ordained that specific thing to take place. The Bible doesn't say. We know there are some things that God has specifically ordained to take place. God's written about it. He told us exactly how it's all going to end. But he doesn't tell us about every single other event. Whether or not he ordained for that thing to happen, or he allowed that thing to happen. See, there's a big difference there. If I ordain something to happen, I'm going to be the cause of it. So is God sovereign? Does he have absolute control over all things? Yes. Does he save people? Yes. Does that therefore mean that God sovereignly predestined certain people to be saved and certain people to be lost? No. But when you start delving into human responsibility in God's sovereignty, and you start going places where the Bible doesn't speak on those issues, then you start running into a really big issue of trying to figure out the mind of God that he has not revealed to us. And that's where false doctrine comes from very often. Let's look at the last thing here real quick, and then I'm done. And we're not, I don't think we're going to look up any of these passages, but this is the rule of patience. 
God has specifically ordained that we grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Okay, so our knowledge of the Scripture is a process that we go through and learn. We gradually grow. And the more you're in the Word, the more you learn. And you know as well as I do, you've read a passage a hundred times before, and then this one time you're going through it, all of a sudden, how long has that been there? Did that just show up? Why does that happen? It's because you've been growing. When you're studying the Bible, you're not going to be able to milk every single thing out of that passage. Why? Because you need other knowledge. You need other experience. You need God to bring you along to a certain point where you're ready for that particular truth. And so we have to be careful. And we have to understand when we're studying the Bible. I remember when I was in Bible college, one of my professors, and he was just a genius. It's like he has read everything and he knew everything. And man, I wanted to be like that. Like right then. Well, that's not possible. One, I'm not him. I've not been through the experience, and he's three times my age at that time. You know, it takes time to grow. It takes time. And so we have to be patient. We're not going to get everything right away. But as we study, as we dig into other things, as we grow in the Lord, we begin to know and understand more of what the Scripture is teaching. But it doesn't all happen immediately. It doesn't all happen right away. It takes time. It takes patience. Father, thank you for the time you've given to us as we are looking at these things to learn how to study the Bible. And Father, I pray that you'd help us to be faithful students, to be diligent in our study of the Scriptures. And now, Lord, I pray that you'd help us as we prepare our hearts for the next service. In Jesus' name, amen.